Genesis 22, and um, we'll look at uh, the entire chapter this morning, kind of the, um, the final, what we might say, the final test of the, uh, of the faith of Abraham, and we've been kind of tracking with him since chapter 12. He leaves Ur of the Chaldeans, and um, we've seen his successes as well as his failures. Uh, we started out calling it a journey of faith, and we kind of changed that to a journey of grace at some point in time because apart from the grace of God, Abraham never makes it to chapter 22 and uh, up this mountain, uh, and it is uh, a pretty incredible chapter. Uh, let's pray. Father, we ask you to bless our time in your word and, uh, and help us, uh, though it may be a familiar passage to us and we might know the story and the outcome, help us to kind of Go through it and see it with fresh eyes and allow your scriptures to, uh, to minister to our hearts, Lord, this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a, an inscription that maybe you can relate to. It says, when as a child I laughed and wept, time crept. When as a youth I dreamed and talked, time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. And later as I older grew, time flew. Soon I shall find while traveling on, Time gone. And uh, that's what it is for Abraham. I don't know if you can relate to that. As you get older, things uh, seem to go much quicker. But uh, he's uh, in context is, uh, is 100 plus. He's 100 when Isaac is born. It's important to note that Isaac is at a minimal 15, 16 years old, and more likely he's in his mid 20s. We'll see next, uh, 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 next week as we get to uh, Abraham in the death of his wife, Sarah, that at the time of her death, Isaac is about 37. So he, he's not a, you know, sometimes you get that Sunday school flannel graph story of Abraham taking this little kid and walking up the mountain. That, that was not the case at all. He's a, he's a, uh, he's a young man. Uh, how old is Abraham? We don't know, but obviously some decades have gone by in raising him. Uh, and now as we get to verse 1, we have a very shocking statement. Let's take a look at it. The proving of Abraham's faith. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, uh, here I am. Now I want to read on, but just to pause for a moment, it's almost like Moses interjects this statement to kind of cushion us from the shock of what is about ready to be said. What's about ready to be said is said for the purpose of, well, he's already stated it, to test Abraham. What is in God's mind when he comes up with this idea, take your son, take him on a mountain, and sacrifice him up there? What's in God's mind? It's a test. It's not going to happen. He would never allow it to happen, but it is a test, as we'll see, to prove the faith of Abraham. Let's go on to verse 2. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. See, I thought that word yonder was a, a southern thing, but apparently it goes all the way back to Abraham. Verse 6, so Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to his father and said, my father, and he said, here I am, your son. <laughs> you know, Isaac's no dummy, right? I mean, he's, he's, a, young, he's a young man. Uh, he gets it, right? I mean, you got the wood, you got the knife, you got the fire. We're going up to do a sacrifice here, and it's just the two of us. It's just very interesting, the interchange. My father, my son, uh, you know, and, he, and then he goes on. Look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamp for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. And, of course, the old King James says, uh, God himself will provide the lamb. And uh, we know, of course, that uh, he did through Jesus Christ. Well, the proving or the testing of Abraham comes after a period of time. Notice verse 1, it came after these things. And again, uh, said, uh, in a sense, to try to help cushion the shock of the statement of what is 
uh, to follow. Notice it's to take your son, your only son, Isaac, to the land uh, of, uh, of Moriah. Uh, of course, he has another son, Ishmael. Later, after the death of Sarah, he will marry again and have other sons. But this is your son, your only, we sometimes say, your only begotten son. Sometimes we like to quote John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. Does that mean created like the Jehovah's Witnesses say? No, it doesn't at all. Uh, it means unique uh, son. Take your unique, the son that is meant for this pur purpose, the son who is the son of the promise of the covenant in this case. Take him and take him to the place I will show you. Again, it's a test. Abraham, of course, doesn't, uh, doesn't know that. Uh, but he's been through several tests, hasn't he? I, uh, one writer kind of listed some of the tests. I added a few to it. Uh, there was the family test, leave Ur the Chaldeans, leave your family, go to the place I'll show you. <laughs> well, he left, but he took part of his family with him. I gave him a C. Followed by the famine test. Famine in the land, uh, he's supposed to wait and trust God, but he leaves and goes to Egypt, lies about his, his uh, wife, uh, says that she is his sister, Got an F for that one. He passed the fellowship test because as they come back, you have the quarreling among the herdsmen of Lot and Abraham. And Lot says, hey, Lot, you take anything you want. I'll take the leftovers. I'm just going to be able to trust the Lord. I think he gets an A on the fellowship test. Then there's the fight test. After those five uh, kings of the north, the confederation come in, swoop down on the plains of, uh, of Gomorrah and Sodom and scoop up all the people in those cities, including Lot and his family, and they uh, take them off. And um, someone comes and reports to Abraham. He takes his 318 special ops guys and put on their night vision goggles. They get on their camels, and they go through the... Well, you remember the story. They go through the night. They catch them. That's the fight test. Uh, he gets an A for that. Then the fortune test, because they come after that. Now the king of Sodom says... Here's all of the, the loot and all the goods that uh, it really is yours to be had because you're the one that rescued us. And, uh, and Abraham refuses to take it lest uh, someone say that it was the king of Sodom that made him rich. So he gets an A on the fortune test. <clears throat> He's doing well, but then he, fall, he uh, gets an F on the fatherhood test. as Sarah gets impatient with God and says, why don't you have a son through... Uh, uh, through Hagar, and, uh, which he does not trusting the Lord. Then there's the farewell test as he has to see them off. God says, yeah, listen to your wife, Sarah, in this case, and, uh, and send them both away, Ishmael and Hagar, uh, the farewell test, he gets an A. He moves again down to the Philistine area, as we saw a few weeks ago, of Gerar, uh, with the uh, interchange of Abimelech, lies again about his wife, Man, he had the great point going. He gets the bombs out with another F. Well, now the final test. I did track. He's got a 2.25 so far. So I guess he's still in school, but uh, uh, there's certainly some uh, speed bumps, some hiccups along the way when it comes to the faith of Abraham that I think we've all taken encouragement in because we all have our, well, we can do pretty well. And then there's other tests that, well, we don't do so, so well. But God just takes him back in, and God just forgives him, and God just restores him. And I think that studying his life has been a great encouragement. The other thing that needs to be stated is that there is a distinct dis difference between the idea of testing and trial and that of temptation. Uh, in James chapter 1, in verse 12 to 16, he talks about the fact that God tests, uh, tempts no man, uh, nor is he tempted with, with evil. Uh, he is not the tempter. That is Satan himself, and there is a distinction. Three of them are that temptations come from our desires, James says, that war within. Trials come from the Lord, who has a special purpose to fulfill. Temptations are used by the devil to bring out the worst in us. Trials are used by the Holy Spirit to bring out the best in us, because in it we see what God really has worked in our lives, and we see God's faithfulness uh, in the midst of them as well as we'll see in this story. Temptations often will seem logical, whereas trials sometimes become very unreasonable, and this is one here. Secondly, the proving came with a command. Verse 2, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, 
Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, certainly we already saw that human sacrifice did take place in Ur of the Chaldeans. Abraham's familiar with it. We know from archaeological discoveries that human sacrifice did take place among the Canaanites. It's not a foreign concept. Uh, the Torah has not been written, but it would all seem very unreasonable, very un, uh, illogical to him at this point. God is asking him to do something that goes beyond common sense and certainly the affection that he has for this uh, son that he waited for for so long and has spent so long raising now. Notice that Moses never tells us how Abraham felt. I don't know how he felt. I would think he would feel horrible. But, you know, there's no hesitation. Gets up the next morning and, and just, just goes. But uh, one writer, Gordon uh, Wenham, says that because of the order of action, First saddling his donkey and then cutting the wood is illogical. He then suggests that Abraham was possibly disoriented over the, the whole thing. Um, and uh, if you've ever gotten that call to get to the emergency room for that son, wife, daughter, whoever it might be, whatever the emergency is, yeah, your brain's not really <clears throat> firing logically at this point. But he's, he's reacting, he's listening, he's trusting. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing, again, when, when we are tested, when we're stretched, often God is not giving explanations. He's just asking us to trust him and to trust his promise. It's a pretty good promise to hang on here because it's through Isaac the covenant goes to that God literally cut covenant with him, and it's through him that all the world's going to be blessed. The Messiah is going to come through him. The redemption of mankind is resting on this kid uh, it's very interesting how, in the end, Abraham will consider that. Third thing about this being proving, as I mentioned, is the obedient. Verse 3, So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and then he's, uh, he's off. Notice also, as we get there, verse 5, uh, he says to the young men, Stay here with the donkey, the lad. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we'll come back to you. One writer said, Abraham had no intentions of bringing back a corpse. He fully believed at this point that uh, whatever happened on that mountain, <clears throat> and if need be, and he had to sacrifice Isaac, God was going to raise him up because God would keep his word. Pretty good that f for a guy that's got a 2.2 <laughs> grade point average so far in the school of faith. Uh, he's, he's come a long ways. Uh, again, wherever we've been at in life, Man, what really counts is how we, how we finish. We said what was in the mind of God was a test, but what was in the mind of Abraham is actually recorded in Hebrews eleven seventeen, where it says, By faith Abraham, when, he was, when was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. There's that key word we mentioned earlier. Of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called concluding, if you're an underliner, concluding, we're going to look at that word in a moment, that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, <clears throat> from which he also received him in a figurative sense. <clears throat> the word uh, concluding, logizomai, is uh, interesting. It means to take inventory, to estimate, to reason, to reckon, to think. Uh, Abraham's going up the mountain. He hears the command. He's taking his son. And so he reasoned it through. He thought it through. This is what's in the mind of Abraham. He concludes in his thinking that since he is the promised child, since he has to have children, since he hasn't had any children yet, he really can't die. Or if he dies, he's got to get raised up. It's reasonable because the God that is asking him is the one that spoke creation into existence that he experienced personally at the age of 100 and his wife at the age of 90, though as good as dead in terms of having children, had this miraculous child. They've personally experienced the miracle power of God. They totally believe in terms of who he is and that he is, he is the creator of, of the universe. Therefore, it was reasonable to conclude that if he had to slay him in obedience to what God said, God absolutely would raise him from the dead. 
So we don't know all the emotion he felt, but we do get this little insight into his thinking, uh, thinking process. Uh, and then lastly, the proving or the testing in a particular place. And um, I know that most of you are aware of it, but just to uh, mention the obvious is that where he takes him, no coincidence, Mount Moriah is the mount on which the current Temple Mount is, is located today. It's a ridge that moves further north and includes what we call Golgotha or Calvary, where Christ died. Uh, as it continues further, there's a big highway cut through it, and you can actually see the ridge at that point. And when we were there a year ago, it was one of the ways that we entered uh, the city when we came into to Jerusalem. So as we get and look to this idea of the picture this gives us of Christ going to the cross, God, by, by no coincidence, takes him to the exact place where eventually Jesus Christ would die for our sins. It was the proving of Abraham's faith. And it's a test by which he would say, when I test you, I will also provide for you. That's what we're going to see. That's what we need to see. When we're stretched, when we're tested, when there's a trial, it's not a temptation, but it's a trial from God. We can always believe that then God will come through uh, in the end. Of course, we always wish he'd come through a little sooner than that midnight hour, but as we're going to see, uh, Abraham would say the same as well. Next is the provision of a substitute sacrifice in verse 9 to 14. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the, of the place, the Lord will provide. <coughs> and then there's a proverb, as it is said to this day, <coughs> in the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided. So the uh, provision of all the angel of the Lord, and we've kind of already been introduced to the angel of the Lord and talked about it being when he shows up, it's not just an angel. He's the angel, the messenger, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. We saw him appear to Hagar when she was uh, thought that she was dying uh, out in the wilderness. Uh, it's going to be the angel of the Lord that speaks to Moses from the burning bush. We'll see uh, here as we continue in Genesis. Uh, it's the angel of the Lord who appears to Gideon. It's the angel of the Lord that tells Malachi, the Messiah is coming. He will be like a refining fire that will, will judge. Now, Jesus mentions this incident as he's debating with the Pharisees in, in John 8. And I've got that for you. But if you want to turn there, I'm going to read from verse 51 to 59. Uh, and again, he's going to make a statement of his own ability to give eternal life, which the Pharisees aren't going to be real thrilled about, of course. Uh, and then he's going to make a reference to the fact that he is God uh, uh, Almighty, God the Eternal One, using the name of God, the great I Am, at which they will attempt to kill him on the spot for having said that. Verse 51, Most assuredly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. There's that statement of God uh, giving us through Jesus Christ eternal life. Then the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, uh, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets are dead? Uh, who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. And of course, anyone could say whatever they want to honor themselves. That's logical. But he says, it is my father who honors me of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say, I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. Now they're calling him a demon. He's calling them liars. You get the ideas a little bit heated uh, at, uh, uh, at, this, uh, at this point. Uh, 
but I do know him and keep his word. Verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. That's the question we're going to look at in a moment. When did Abraham see his day? Verse 57, then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, uh, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was born, I existed. I am God Almighty, the Eternal One. Uh, and again, verse 59, they're not real thrilled at that. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Jesus uh, is really the angel of the Lord calling from heaven to Abraham here and uh, makes reference to uh, this incident uh, there in John. Secondly, the provision becomes a picture of a substitute sacrifice. And uh, there's lots of, there's lots of uh, pictures in the Old Testament or types that we could look at that give us great insight into the work and the person of Jesus Christ. But uh, this is probably the holy of holies in terms of seeing, seeing not just the Son and his willingness to give his life for us, but to see the Father and his willingness to give the Son. And sometimes we... Uh, you know, in our, even in our worship and our worship songs and our thanksgiving and so forth, <clears throat> which focus on Jesus' sacrifice for us, rightfully so, we forget that it was a loving father that, that gave, uh, uh, gave his son, which would be tougher for you as a dad, to suffer pain yourself or have your son suffer it. You take it any time, right? Uh, so as crushing as this is in terms of what Christ did, uh, hear the insight of the father's involvement. Now again to that John 8 passage, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad Jesus said, so how did or what did Abraham see in this picture? Well, in Isaac's miraculous birth, Abraham saw the day of Christ's birth, which was of course miraculous also. In Isaac's marriage, as we'll see in Genesis 24, he say the day he saw the day of Christ coming for his bride. He saw the son, Isaac, and saw him coming for his bride, Rebekah, which is a very interesting picture because we're going to see the death and the resurrection of the son here, Isaac, in a, in a picture since we don't see him anymore. He disappears from the pages of Scripture. When does he show up again? When he's coming for the bride, the rapture of the church. It's a very interesting picture. These are ways that... Abraham would have seen the day of Christ. And of course, on Mount Moriah, <coughs> Isaac willingly, he willingly, again, the picture is not a kid, but a young man, willingly lays himself on the altar. I mean, uh, if he's 26, then Abraham's 126. I don't know if he's in good a shape as Charlie is at 98, but I don't know if he could have picked this young guy up and dropped him on, on that uh, altar. I got a feeling Isaac probably had to help his dad get up there, and he had to get on the altar himself and say, go ahead and tie me up now and uh, do what you got to do. But uh, he saw the day of Christ's death and resurrection. That's what Abraham saw. What we should see, and again in this picture, the obvious, the father and the son acted together. Notice verse 6 and 8. Twice it is repeated, the two of them went together. Again, emphasizing the father and the son, both willing, both doing this together. Secondly, the son had to die. Abraham carries the knife, the torch. Both of them could be used as instruments of death. Uh, and of course, then the statement from uh, Isaac to say, and where is the lamb? Oh, God himself will provide the lamb, Abraham says. It's a declaration of trust, an expression of hope, and certainly a prophecy of, uh, uh, of the future. In Isaac's case, a substitute died for him, but nobody could take the place of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that question about the lamb, because there wasn't a lamb, was it? Where is the lamb? Well, there wasn't a lamb. It was a ram, wasn't it? It worked. It provided the substitute death. Where the lamb is? That question is not answered until we get to John the Baptist in John 129 when he says of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That question waits to be answered in the person of Jesus Christ. The third thing, the son bore the burden of sin as he carries the wood. Now some would say, and I understand that, Jesus carried a wooden cross up Calvary 
or to Calvary. Uh, here Isaac is carrying the wood up the hill. But as you'll recall, that, that picture breaks down a little because Isaac carries the wood all the way there. Uh, Jesus does not carry the cross all the way. Remember, it's given to another to help him along the way. No, I think it's a picture of what is laid on Christ, what is laid on Isaac is the burden of our sins that are placed upon him. Paul says, he that had no sin became that sin offering for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet said, the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. And the sun going up that hill carrying the wood is a picture of Christ carrying the burden of our sins. And then very important, the fourth thing, the ram would die instead of the sun. If you're a Bible underliner, look at verse 13. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. That's the statement of substitutionary death. Christ died for the sins of the whole world. We say that, uh, that his, uh, his death was sufficient payment for the sins of every person that ever lived. And the Bible is pretty clear about that. It was sufficient. But for a person to receive that forgiveness, he must personally come to faith in Jesus Christ. Is Christ, we use the word, vicarious atonement. Vicarious, it means the substitute instead of just what we see here. You and I should have, in a sense, died on the cross. You and I should be punished for our sins, every one of us personally. But Jesus died instead of us so that we might be forgiven. But everybody's got to acknowledge that personally at one point in their life and believe what Christ did for him. If we confess with our mouth, and believe in our heart that uh, Jesus is Lord, that he raised from the dead, Paul says, then our sins will be forgiven. It's not enough for people to say, I believe that Jesus died for the sins of the world. True, but did he die for your sins? <clears throat> Should have you have gone to the cross? Should you be executed and sent to hell for all eternity for your sins? Absolutely. But instead of, Christ died for your sins. Matthew 20, 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The, the payment was sufficient for everyone, but not everyone will come. <clears throat> the Son was raised from the dead. <coughs> now, Isaac did not literally die, but figuratively he did. And that's what the writer of Hebrew tells us. It was what we read there in Hebrews 11, 19, where it says, in a figurative sense, he died, but certainly it's a picture of Jesus' death on the cross. What a picture, the Father and the Son going up there together, the willingness of the Father, the willingness of, of the Son, uh, the willingness of, uh, of Abraham to the point of holding the knife in his hand over. What's he going to do? He's going to cut his throat. He's going to bleed him out. He's going to dismember him and then he's going to light the whole thing on fire. That's what Abraham's going to do if required. And if out of those ashes God needs to, Abraham believes that out of the ashes he's going to bring his son back to life. Pretty good for a guy that got a lot of Fs along the way. Pretty, pretty amazing. But what a picture for us that we have here of what Christ has done for us <clears throat> and what the Father has done. The third thing about the provision, remembered by a new name, verse 14. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. So, again, it was to be a whole burnt offering, everything consumed. One writer said, all we have and all we are, God is upon the altar, consume our lives to your glory. You know, when we read something in the Bible, and especially a narrative, it's you know, sometimes good to say, where am I at in this story? And certainly we, we should be able to see it in terms of the picture of what Christ has done. Uh, we'll talk about it at the end of the message that sometimes God calls us to lay our own Isaacs down. It could be a relationship, it could be a career, it could be a lot of different things. And he wants us to say, how much do you really love me? You know, I taught this message a number of years ago and I entitled it, Too Focused on the Family. Because <laughs> that's what he's testing them with here. 
Uh, how much do you really love me? But the other person in this story is Isaac, who's willing to crawl on that altar and lay there. I don't know if you've ever done that before in a figurative sense. Because that's what Paul says in Romans 12.1. Remember, that's the whole burnt offering. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your spiritual act of worship. Then, then you'll understand the will of God, be able to find the will of God when we come to this place of complete dedication. The proverb, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Interesting, we could say in the mount of the Lord, it definitely is pictured. We have Yahweh Yaira, or we say sometimes in English, Jehovah Jaira, which means uh, the Lord will see to it or the Lord will provide. As I mentioned, uh, the old King James probably gets the closest. The Lord himself will provide. Uh, and, of course, that provision is Jesus Christ. Uh, Hudson Taylor, founder of China in Inland Missions and wonderful, uh, uh, incredible Christian. And if you have a chance, should one of those biographies of stories of great Christians that you should uh, read and you can get the kids' version, even for reading to your kids. But um, he, had, he had a plaque uh, in his home that he always had with two, two Hebrew words. And one was Ebenezer and the other was Jehovah Jireh. Ebenezer coming from uh, 1 Samuel 7, 12. The Ebenezer stone. Uh, again, they, would take, they took stones and, and piled them up and said, we are going to use these to remember God's faithfulness of the, of the past. Uh, and sometimes uh, that's not a bad thing for us to do, whether we physically take stones and drop them on the ground or we just remember, in a sense, God's faithfulness. Man, if you're ever going through a trial, you're ever being stretched, it's really good <laughs> to start looking back. All the times God has been faithful, all the time God's come through, right in the midnight hour. But, man, he came through. His promises are, are true. So Hudson Taylor's got that, and then he's got the Jehovah Jireh. Which is what, what is he saying? And God will continue. In the future, God will provide. And, uh, and basically saying, I'm going to live right in between. Remembering God's faithfulness in the past and the fact that God will continue to be faithful uh, in, in the future. <clears throat> That's what we need to see about God when he's testing and when he is stretching us. Where does the, the Lord uh, provide uh, our needs? Uh, here it's in the place of assignment. Abraham's at the right place so God could meet his needs. He would have never seen the ram from the bottom of the hill. He certainly would have never seen it if he stayed back home in Beersheba, doubting God and what God would have him to do. The only way he ever see God's miraculous provision is from the top of that, that hill. He's in a place where he is supposed to be. And sometimes we need to understand we have no right or expectation to believe that God will provide when we refuse to be in his will. And it's the same for us. And when does he meet <coughs> that need? Well, it's a midnight hour. He, he waits till he's holding the knife over his son's head. And you could uh, imagine uh, Abraham at that point. Would have been good, maybe at the bottom of the hill, give me a little heads up here, you know, before uh, I was kind of trusting you, but, you know, like, you know. But that's the way it is, isn't it, sometimes? Uh, the provision is in that last hour. Well, the proving of Abraham's faith, it's an incredible test. And we learn that where God tests and stretch, he also provides. There's a substitute sacrifice picturing for us Christ's death on the cross. So let's look at the promise as it is renewed. Verse 15 to 24. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, as the sand on which, uh, uh, which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Now, it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Indeed, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor, again, his brother back in Ur of the Chaldeans. Uh, these are listed to get to the, the introduction of Rebekah, whose his firstborn, Booz, his brother Kamiel, the father of Aram, Chesed, Haso, uh, Pildash, uh, Yidlap, and Bethuel, and Bethuel begot Rebekah. 
where we want to get to. These eight, Milcabor de Nahor, Abraham's brother, his concubine, whose name was Reuma, also bore Teba, Gaham, uh, Tahash, and Ma'akha. So Abraham, again, has this whole experience. In the midst of it, the promise came with a sworn testimony. Very interesting, verse 15. <coughs> again, it's the angel of the Lord. By myself I have sworn, uh, says the Lord. <clears throat> the writer of Hebrews gives us a little commentary on this whole passage in Hebrews uh, 6.13, where it says, For when uh, God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability, cannot change, of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. Men will swear by someone greater. Who does God swear by? No one greater. So he swears by himself and says to Abraham at this point, I will absolutely keep my word to you. Uh, and again, we saw that when he cut covenant with him, walking between those animals, got it in the form of a, a torch passing through Abraham on the side, the Abrahamic covenant, unconditional and only dependent upon God's promise to him. And now this reiteration, there's no one greater, so I swear by myself. And to this day, again, those promises are true, that through the descendant, which becomes the Messiah, all the nations of the earth are blessed through Jesus Christ in terms of salvation. To the physical descendants of Abraham, the Jewish people, I'll bless those that bless you, I'll curse those that curse you. He gives them the seed, the land, and the blessing, and they're still fighting about the land over there, aren't they? Very interesting. It's almost comical at times to watch the, uh, the peace process go on, knowing the ultimate outcome in it. There will no, be no peace until Jesus Christ returns uh, for his people, but as nations turn their back against the Jewish people historically, then God has turned their back uh, against them. And we know from Scripture there will be a growing anti-Semitism that we're experiencing right now uh, in the world and certainly in our own country. It's very interesting. I was just uh, watching a total secular guy on the news the other day, and he was just talking about the fact that, that right now what you hear about since 9-11 is this grave concern that we should all have that, uh, that Muslims are unjustly persecuted or attacked in any way. And that's, that's the storyline for the news. It kind of helps flow from the, from the whole 9-11 thing. And you kind of hear about that, right? That's a, that's a big, grave concern. If there's, if there's anything that happens worldwide, it's big, big news, this happened over in this area. Is that actually happening? Uh-uh. There's, <laughs> there's hardly any attacks against Muslims. Are there attacks against Jewish people? Ten times. Ten times the amount. For every one Muslim that has ever attacked because of his faith, there's 10 Jewish people that are attacked in this country this last year because of their faith. You hear about that all the time, don't you? No, you don't have a word. It doesn't fit the story. It doesn't fit the narrative that's, uh, that's out there. So we're going to uh, you know, not worry about the, let the facts confuse our good story that we've, we've got going. But a growing, growing anti-Semitism that's in the world today. But God says, I swear by myself that I'll bless those that bless you and I'll curse those that curse you. And that the Messiah is going to come through Abraham's descendants and he will give them uh, the land. Uh, and then the, the genealogy here is given. It's a promise, uh, in a sense, to Isaac because we've got, again, the mention of Rebekah, who, of course, becomes the wife of Isaac. We'll read more about that incredible, beautiful picture and typology of of Christ in coming for his church. Great, very interesting, uh, you know, marriage arrangement and a, a great love story. As like I said earlier, <clears throat> we want to come back to the theme, laying Isaac uh, on the altar. And um, sometimes we're asked by God to do that in a, in a number of different ways. I uh, had read uh, a couple of quotes from uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman, who experienced this in a tremendous way back on May 17, 2008, when his 17-year-old son was backing their 
SUV out of the driveway and inadvertently ran over their uh, five-year-old daughter, Maria. I don't know if you're a Stephen Curtis Chapman fan, but it wrote a song about her when they first uh, adopted her. <coughs> a wonderful Christian uh, musician, singer, songer, uh, songwriter, uh, I think uh, one of the best Christian concerts uh, that I've ever been to. We were at that, right? The guy preached the gospel like four times. He begged people to come to faith in Christ. I mean, it was just awesome. It was why he was there. Very talented, very gifted guy, but man, you could really really see his heart and appreciate what he was uh, all about. And now this terrible tragedy comes upon him. Well, apparently he was in the habit of opening his concerts during that time period with the song, uh, the Matt Redmond song, Blessed Be Your Name. You give and you take away. And people were kind of, is he still going to do that? Uh, and he, he did. Uh, Blessed Be Your Name was the first song that he sang May 21st, after the, uh, Maria's death, he says, as I sang this song, it uh, wasn't a song. It was a cry. It was a scream. It was a prayer. And he, as he explains to an audience of 5,000, I found an amazing comfort and peace that surpasses all understanding. And then he shares uh, ab about Maria's death. He said that he reconsidered all the words to all the songs he'd ever written. And wanted to know, could he still sing them and could he still believe them after losing his little girl? He said, one of those songs that he had to think through again was entitled Yours, which addresses the fact that everything is God's. It's all, all yours. And he said, uh, after going through that song, he said, this song in particular, I came to a new realization. There's not an inch of creation that God doesn't look at and say, all of that's mine. And as a result, he wrote a, another verse to that particular song that says, I've walked the valley of death's shadow, so deep and dark I could barely breathe. I had to let go of more than I could bear, and I've questioned everything that I believe. Still, even here in this great darkness, a, a comfort and a hope comes breaking through. As I can say in life or death, God, we belong to you. I don't know where you find yourself uh, in the story, but uh, we go through the trials and we're stretched. Uh, and in God's mind, it's a test. Uh, in our mind, we don't know that always. Sometimes I wish there was that voice, you know, like the civil defense warning, this is only a test. You know, I wish, why, why can't there be that? Okay, it's, I, it's a test. I just got to kind of hang in there because God's going to come through. It looks really bad right now, but God's going to come through. And sometimes maybe we need to hear that, that voice from heaven. This is, only a, this is only a test, but it can be so, so difficult at times. And, of course, we want to see ourselves in the story as, uh, as, uh, as the Isaac. I heard a message by, uh, by, I was listening to a message by David Hawking. He said uh, back in his uh, younger days when he was a little crazier, he actually uh, was in a church where they had like those, those altar tables, those tables up front. He said he didn't want to make the gals come up, but he asked the guys to come up. Come, we're going to say, this is the altar. Come lay down on the altar. And this, this young teenage guy got out of the back, came down, and crawled up on that table and kind of laid there. And they just started weeping. It's kind of, and then other, one by one, guys, guys came forward and, uh, and did that. It, it was just something about picturing ourselves on an altar where, where we say uh, our lives are really, really yours. Now, that's what the burnt offering is, complete dedication. was not required. It's just something that, that people did to say, my life is truly yours. And uh, if Christ was willing to die, if the Father was willing to sin, then that's kind of, that becomes the, the natural response as the, as the Lord works in our heart. It's not because we're, perfect. None of us are getting all A's, right, in this uh, journey we're on. We've all got some F's in there, a couple of C minuses, you know, once in a while an A, not, not such a great grade point average. But uh, in the end, in the end, we want to be where Abraham was at and where Isaac was at too, sometimes overlooked in this story. Well, let's pray. Lord, we just uh, lift our own lives before you. We pray that we could, by your grace, by our strength or because we think we know so much or we're such a good person or a good Christian or we've attained a certain amount of Bible knowledge just by your grace. We pray that we could 
Present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you, which would then be our spiritual act of worship. Lord, is our response to your love and your mercy that you've shown us through Jesus Christ and, and to the Father who was willing to give his Son, his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, we're so thankful that you're a, a God who is, as we sing sometimes, only wise. You're the only wise one. And that you're gracious to us. Lord, so build us up in our most holy faith. Strengthen us and stretch us through those trials and those testings, Lord. Help us. We may not have the explanation, but Lord, help us trust your promises as we go through them. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. To the courts of the king, I've been assured in.